In part two, we're going to be talking about specifically about the genus Homo, starting with Homo erectus. And so uh, we call ourselves Homo sapiens. So these are creatures that we've decided that evolutionary speaking, they are close enough to us that we all share the same genus. Uh, Homo erectus was first named because we believed when we found these skeletons that they were the first creatures that were standing upright or erect. We now know that that is obviously not true since we've been talking about bipedalism and the Australopith Australopithecus species, but the name has stuck because uh, some things uh, from, from older times, uh, the names are, are, are simply a carryover from them. So this is uh, the Homo erectus, um, finds are, are interesting uh, in part because we have uh, a the some of the specimens are are pretty large some of them are over what would be six feet tall so uh, kind of within the range of you know what we might consider humans um, we also see a definite in the homo erectus uh, the skeletons that are classified as homo erectus we see some cranium expansion or getting larger brains that happens around 1.7, 1.9 million years ago. So instead of just having ape-like cranium being bipedal, with Homo erectus we see uh, some larger brained creatures. A lot of people speculate that uh, they probably could control fire, uh, maybe in the environment, but some people have also uh, speculated that they may have been able to cook and that this was related to uh, the cranium expansion. We'll talk about that a little bit more in our archaeology unit. Uh, this has been uh, debated a lot, but there's some evidence that there, there may have been uh, at, least, at least the use of fire. There's also some evidence that Homo erectus uh, would have not only been able to do endurance walking, which we talked about with the hominins, but they might also have been able to do endurance hunting or endurance running. Uh, the human primate is a, is a peculiar in that we're some of the only creatures that can actually run a marathon. Uh, we can run long distances if we're if we're fit, that is, uh, and we can sometimes out endure uh, four-legged creatures that might be faster over a short stretch, but are uh, if because we can uh, we can sweat and we can carry our water, uh, we can outrun or out endure some of these creatures and thus be able to kind of hunt them down, even if we don't have the uh, sort of the, the the predator, the classic predator of being able to sort of pounce on them. Uh, so this is an interesting, perhaps, hunting strategy that, that we have seen evidence that, that some, of the, some human groups even use this today. Um, and it may have been uh, something that, that happened with some of the Homo erectus. What's very important for us is that, as I mentioned, up through the hominins, up through all the bipedal stuff, all of that evolution takes place in Africa. With Homo erectus, this is the first time that we see bipedal creatures moving out from Africa and going across into what is called the Old World, into Europe and Asia. So we have Homo erectus expanding the range of what bipedal hominins were, uh, were, were living in across a much larger geographic area. Still, the, again, the key stuff that's happening in human evolution is all happening in Africa, but we see this range expansion with Homo erectus at about 1.9 or 2 million years ago. Now, as we talked about uh, in the uh, with the hominins, we have also had to sort of reconsider what's going on when we think about what happens with Homo erectus. In the old days, this was a very simple story. It's like, aha, look, we have these bipedal creatures and their brains are bigger, their tools are better, and that just led straight up to human beings. Um, we're now sort of rethinking how we analyze creatures of from sort of 2 million to about 300,000 years ago. 
And here I'm going to be bringing in uh, the article that I gave you by uh, the lead author is uh, Lee Berger, and then it's co-authored by by uh, four other people. So in the way that people, uh, when there are one author or two authors, so let's say it's Muckle and Gonzalez, we put those in parentheses as Muckle and Gonzalez, but when it's like one of these scientific articles that has multiple authors, what you usually do is put the first author's last name, Berger here, and then you might say, et al, which is the Latin for and others. So it's a little complicated, but that's just to indicate that this paper was worked on by a number of different contributors. And that's the way in some ways some of the scientific work is going. And so we'll cite it uh, like that. What people are reanalyzing, and we talked about teeth and how important teeth have been in the fossil record. And what Burgers and, and company say is that oftentimes we've even uh, assigned, assigned whole classification schemes based on, based on a single tooth. Now they're going to be questioning that, but that's what had happened in the past. I also mentioned that the genetic evidence made things more complicated. And Berger and others here talk about hybridization. This is on page eight, which is the idea that, you know, when we think about evolution, we often think about sort of these linear splits and that there would be these splits that go off. When what actually seems to happen is that creatures might sort of come back together and recombine and that would accelerate the evolutionary process. So we might have thought, well, they've speciated or they've gone off into different species, but then they'll somehow reconnect and their hybrid, uh, the hybrids of two species, I guess they wouldn't be biological species, but you know, sort of more distant than before, produce uh, new and interesting not entirely new, but interesting new variations on those creatures. Again, we see that there has been a large range of diversity from hominins through, through and as especially now we know much more about the diversity of different homo species as well. So before when we only had the homo erectus finds, uh, we didn't know about all the other kinds of creatures that might be contributing to this wide range of variation or diversity. Again, this has led us to the idea that evolution is not simply this kind of linear step-by-step -step that we often see in the sort of comic book version of evolution, but a much more idea that the, the creatures that we find are sometimes interesting different combinations of things. And you can't just base, oh, well, if the hand looks a certain way, that must mean it's a more sophisticated, or if the brain is larger, then it must be of you know a certain time period. And so what they're trying to do is saying, well, we have to be very careful and we're only looking at a fragmentary specimen. We have to think about, you know, where should we assign that? And what they're saying is that because of the homo and the lady find, we'll talk about that in a second, because the homo and the lady find was so uh, impressive, it, it was much more than just a fragment, what it enables us to do is to rethink some of our assumptions about how one creature became another creature, these linear ideas about human evolution, and, you know, and start to rethink how we are uh, characterizing this, the whole, uh, the whole stepwise notion of human evolution. And so this was a pretty recent article. It was put out in, in 2017 about a very famous uh, find that you may have seen on Discover and Nova. Uh, it's a, a popularized uh, find and I wanted to put it out there. But I think that before we start getting into the find itself, I want to just sort of think about how it helps us rethink or reanalyze uh, this notion that we had about uh, homo, homo erectus and how that automatically led up to human beings. The way I like to think about it is that, that we are having, we, we are seeing two revolutions in how we look at brain size and the cranium. And, you know, I mentioned that we often try to look back and find creatures that are smart or big brained because that's what we think we are is really smart and big brained. And so our first revolution that we talked about is how in the 1970s people found out that no, it wasn't that big brains separated 
ape-like creatures from each other. It was bipedalism that was the real separator or the real thing that led to different kinds of lineages. So that was the first cranial revolution. The second one is one that I think is happening today or has happened since around 2010, which is that we're starting to realize that some of these creatures can use tools and be very sophisticated, uh, all the things that we attributed to Homo erectus, without necessarily having a large cranium or without much cranium expansion. So there's all sorts of things that it looks like Homo naledi and some of these other creatures could do, but they didn't have that, those larger heads which we assumed people needed in order to use tools and do these kinds of things. One of the examples, and again, I go back a little bit uh, here, was before Homo naledi, the find of Homo floresiensis, uh, which was also known as the hobbit finds and on an island in Indonesia. So these were pretty small creatures that, but still seemed to uh, belong to the Homo, uh, the Homo genus. Um, and they were able to do hunting and, and use fire and, and tools and, and do things that we normally thought would be the attribute of larger and large brain creatures. So that was part of the thing that, part of the discovery that broke this open. But really I think Homo naledi is the real, uh, the real kicker here in that we have creatures that are uh, in some ways very, uh, you might say very human-like and sophisticated, but in other ways uh, seem to have small craniums and other features uh, which are not necessarily associated with this level of sophistication. So we have to rethink some of our assumptions about kind of intelligence and, and how uh, different features map onto the fossil record. Um, Homo naledi, this is, the don't have to copy this down. This is from Wikipedia. I just want to put a few, a little a picture of some of the, the find here. And this is only a part of, part of the find. It was, what's amazing about it, or one of the amazing things about it, is how much of a fossil find we have here. We talked about sometimes only having teeth or one tooth, or in the case of Artie having one one skeleton that had to be reconstructed over 10 years. Here we're talking about at least 15 different individuals and lots and lots of different elements. So we get a very extremely amazing complete picture of what Homo naledi was like. And as such, it causes us to sort of rethink some of our assumptions about what creatures belong with each other. Now, these creatures were discovered in uh, sort of buried in a cave. And as one of you noted, uh, the, there was a, a crucial effort here by six female scientists who were sort of the, what they sometimes referred to as underground astronauts who had to descend into this cave. They think that the best explanation for why these creatures were buried or were in this cave and were preserved as well as they were, that the best explanation is that they were actually burying, or as they refer to it, funerary caching, which is to say that they were burying their dead deliberately. And so this is a, a you know, again, it, it sort of causes us to, to rethink some of our assumptions about what different creatures might have been doing at that stage. Um, you know, and so on, and Michael Gonzalez had names the six women scientists who were important in, in sort of this discovery and extraction. And then when I read Lindsay Hunter, I was like, hey, wait a second, I'm friends with her on Facebook. So that was a, when Facebook used to have that other font, I did a screenshot of her uh, sort of spelunking into the cave. And there's another picture of her in, in, a, in an article about, you know, uh, the work that she and others had to do to do this kind of extraction. But it was a huge and very interesting find, but it causes us to rethink some of our assumptions about uh, how this, how the uh, human evolution occurred. So, as I mentioned, most of the, when we're, when we're thinking about human evolution, almost all of it in the hominin stage occurs in Africa and our best finds are over here in East Africa. With Homo erectus, we have different fossil finds uh, sort of spread out across 
uh, Eurasia. And so Homo erectus uh, expands the geographical range of what is going on outside of Africa. We are now thinking that, you know, in Africa you have uh, creatures that developed that were more like Homo naledi and a, a wide diversity of creatures. We uh, have the Neanderthals, which are descended from, you know, probably the Homo erectus uh, expansion uh, that occupied uh, much of Eurasia. And also more recently discovered, uh, and this is more of a genetic find than a fossil find, but the Denisovans, who were kind of cousins of the Neanderthals and lived uh, more eastward over in Asia. So as the Homo erectus sort of fades out, we have these other uh, Homo populations, Homo neanderthalus, Homo denisovan, Homo naledi, which are sort of taking up uh, and become part of the, the human evolutionary story. I want to talk uh, first about the Neanderthals because they're uh, an older find and we know more about them than some of the others. Uh, they've been more, more well researched. So Homo Neanderthal was a, was a uh, I say a successful species because they live, you know, they they live for a long time and through a varied landscape in Europe and in the and in the Middle East, they had a pretty wide geographical range from about 400,000 years ago to up to about 35,000 years ago. So, you know, it was a, it, they, they, they were, they did, they did a lot of uh, things that were interesting. They had, uh, there's evidence that they made tools, that they could hunt, uh, that they probably cooked, had clothing, um, some people have even found evidence of jewelry. And some of the early cave art that we found uh, is actually now attributed to the Neanderthals. So this was a, you know, I mean, I think that in some ways it, we used to use Neanderthal as an insult, but in fact, uh, they, they seem to be a pretty sophisticated and successful species that lived in this, in, in this time period. Homo sapiens appear uh, in Africa at about 200 to 300,000 years ago. And so when Homo sapiens come around, uh, they, they first appear in Africa and then they begin to spread out uh, across, across the old world, across Eurasia. And as Homo sapiens take, I guess, uh, go into or expand their range, the other bipedal species that were inhabiting these areas eventually disappear. So the Neanderthals and Denisovans, um, the Homo naledi, uh, eventually go away. And so uh, Berger and his colleagues say that modern our, us or modern Homo sapiens, they say that we were a phylogenetic relic, which is a, a, a species that remains that that was more diverse or had a, a larger range of variation in the past and is kind of uh, homo sapiens are, are sort of a a more limited version of that previous variation now we've known so when the Neanderthals are so named because they were found in Neander Valley in Germany and uh, the German word for valley or or is uh, Thal or T-H-A-L. Um, and so it, there's some, there's various spellings of why some people spell it with an H and some people have updated to the modern spelling of Neanderthals. Uh, at first when the Neanderthals were discovered, they were thought to be, you know, direct ancestors to Homo sapiens, but we quickly figured out that they were a separate a separate subspecies or species. They were not sort of on the main line of Homo sapiens evolution. Um, but the question has always, ha, has long been, well, to what extent did Homo sapiens interact with the Neanderthals? To what extent were they, were they, did they ever interbreed? Were there fights? What kind of relationship did they have? And for a long time, and for much of the time that I was teaching this stuff, uh, we believe that it the it, that they did not interbreed. Uh, 
that they may have interacted, but there was no interbreeding. Uh, this was based on a, on a study of mitochondrial DNA, which suggested that Homo sapiens uh, all had, uh, a, went sort of back to one mother in Africa at about 70,000 years ago, and there was no evidence that there was a Neanderthal contribution to the Homo sapien or the contemporary Homo sapien genome. So uh, like I said, up until 2010, it looked like there was very little interaction between or and especially interbreeding between uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. And then in 2010, we got what I call the the, ad, the one to four percent admixture surprise, which is that using more sophisticated genetic techniques that went beyond simply examining the, the uh, mitochondrial DNA, that people were able to discover evidence that there had been Neanderthal interbreeding and admixture. That is to say that a lot of the people in uh, today's world, uh, especially in Europe and in Asia, had uh, evidence of having some contribution from the Neanderthal genome from, you know, one to four percent of their DNA. Like I said, this, this, this took some very sophisticated uh, analysis to discover because for a long time we couldn't even see this kind of admixture. But it now looks like there were some interbreeding events, probably mostly in the Middle East. And then as Homo sapiens uh, spread out into various parts of Eurasia, they carried with them uh, some of this Neanderthal DNA. Also in 2010, analyzing uh, some of the, uh, some, uh, a pinky bone uh, found in Denisova, Denisova Cave in Siberia. Uh, it was, they analyzed the genome and found out that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't Homo sapien and it wasn't exactly Neanderthal. Uh, it seems to have been a cousin of the Neanderthals as we now call the Denisovans. There remains, we still don't have a lot of sort of fossil evidence for for what's going on, but we do have some evidence that there was Denisovan admixture that happens in some contemporary populations today, mostly in sort of uh, Southeast Asia and going into uh, the Australian area, uh, so sort of, sort of uh, east, the Eastern Old World, so to say. So I think what this points out is that uh, when we think about human evolution and how we sort of uh, evolved and mixed together and, and came up with this anatomical mosaic that we now call Homo sapiens, human beings, that we have been moving around, migrating, mating, and mixing with our own species and closely related species for a very long time. So this is not something that just happened, uh, you know, 20 years ago that there's some sort of mixture. This is people have, that's how we became people is by, uh, by, by moving, migrating and continuing to sort of combine and recombine. So this is not something that, that is, uh, that, People were, were isolated from each other and developed separately. Uh, people have been interlinked across, the, uh, across our range. This is not something that just happened last year when people started intermarrying each other. This is something that people are humans and Homo sapiens and Neanderthals and Denisovans have been doing for a long time. All right, 